Father, we come before you on this Palm Sunday. And Lord, we are reminded today that the King has come. 
But you have entered through me, so Lord. Lord, we pray for your mercy and your grace upon us today as we enter Holy Week. That you would be watching over us. And Lord, we lay at your feet all of these concerns and despairs, knowing that you are bigger and greater than all of them. And that you have set all things right in the end to your Son's life, death, and resurrection. We pray, Father, for our world, our nation, and our denomination, that all the divisions contained therein, and we pray, Father, for unification under your Son, under his cross, and under his blood. Watch over us, Father. We also pray, Father, for the Clover family and the Scott family. Lord, we pray that as they mourn the passing of their loved ones, that you would have your hand upon them, giving them your mercy and grace and peace as only you can. We pray the same for those who are loved ones, especially the children of the Presbyterian school children. Pray, Father, for your grace and your mercy to walk over those folks there. We pray the same for those who lost their young sons and daughters in the military helicopter crash. Father, we thank you that this life is not all there is. Lord, there is much evil in this world, but we also remember, Lord, on this holy week that you came to vanquish it. Thank you, Father, that in the end you win and you set all things right. Thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy and the peace and the hope we have through your Son, in whose name we pray for them. Amen. Would you join me in our congregational reading? This is appropriately Passion or Palm Sunday. Let us pray this together. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And let us continue as well with the Apostles' Creed. The belief that we hold in Christian. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven. The third day, He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from men who shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life and the life. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite up our kids for our children's message today. Well, we've got a few. I know a lot of our families are out traveling around. We'll see you next week, but I know I've got a few of you. Today is Palm Sunday. Now, I need somebody who's willing to be a king. Are you going to be a king? Okay. Let's see here. Let's let the things be king, see? Let me get a crown. Yeah, that's it, right? Uh, let's see here. Oh, thing in the world of dark. All right, so you're using darkness with your twin sister. There you go. There you go. Hold that. Perfect. You know what else the thing needs? You need a mode of transportation. But not a car or an airplane or a limo. We need a horse. It's going to be willing to be the horse. Yeah, and everyone wants to be the horse. Yeah, a pastor is going to be the horse. Pretending for horse here. In other words, it, it's as close as I can get, okay? You also need a little rug. This will fit perfect. Put it on. There we go. All right. There's problems when you're the young thing, huh? There we go. Put your hands in there. There we go. There we go. I think you got that backwards. Oh, well, that's fine. Let's see here. Okay. Now I need you to go up to the third stage here. 
And you will be the one that first we need to become a star. So, then look out for all of your local subjects. That's why we need to over here. I don't know. No. No. You know, you might be clean on your own. Right? Yeah, there you go. And everybody on the desk has four branches that they have brought for you. What are your four branches for the king who's being thrown to the ground? Now, how do you feel? Do you feel special? Do you feel alone? Okay, that's that good. That's that good. Really remember, I'm trying to send a business plan to enter into Jerusalem to establish this kingdom. As a conquering king, one was brought into town on a horse with the military guards who the shouts and praises of the people. They would be crying freely and they would rule over the subject. But Jesus isn't the normal guy. Jesus is a little bit different. He doesn't just find that. He doesn't get the cross from the prison. But he doesn't get the roll. Sorry. Yeah, you know, you need to get that up here. It's probably easier. There we go. You just need that there. He doesn't get the, the royal guards, so in fact, the royal guards were against Jesus. They will arrest him later on. Um, he doesn't get the cross. He actually gets a donkey. Instead, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to the Jesus found on this way the normal thing. The Jesus is not the same thing as the same thing. And he hasn't come to be served, but to say, He's come to establish the spiritual kingdom, to save you and me from sin and death. There's no mistake. He is the king. He is worthy of shouts and praise. But he hasn't come. To do just anything, to be treated as royalty, to come to be accepted by the Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And on this Palm Sunday, we pray, O Lord, that we would remember what your Son came to do. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son in our place to be the King, but to also be the sacrifice for our sin. Thank you, Lord, for your majesty, your mercy, and your glory. In the Son, Jesus, is name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. I'll take these back and toss them off to the side here. I mean, unless you want to wear it for the rest of the day. No, I didn't think so. Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the end of chapter 10 and beginning of chapter 11, and it's all around Jesus' triumphant entry. Beginning just before it, then they, Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho, a city near Jerusalem, and as Jesus and his disciples together with the Lamb's crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the little son begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then he rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he said it all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call oh, him. So he called to the blind man, Get up, on your feet, he is calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus along the road. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village of you, 
and just as you enter it, you will find a bolt tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, then the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered, and Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. And when they brought the cloak to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches and they cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Oh God, blessed is the man who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our Father, David. O God, in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple court. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany, which is well. Here ends our scripture reading this morning. Would you join me in prayer before we begin the message? Heavenly Father, on this Palm Sunday, we remember who is king. We remember who is in charge, and we remember, O oh Lord, where we find our hope and our peace. Thank you, Jesus, that you are not like earthly kings, that you didn't come just to serve, or to be served, but to serve. And you came to save us from our sins. Watch over us, Father, as we enter Holy Week. All glory and honor and praise to you and your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. The famous words on Palm Sunday, the ones we all remember as we speak our our palm branches, right? Our Hosanna, blessed is you, comes in the name of the Lord. If you're on Sunday, like I was as a kid and still on today, Palm Sunday is special because you actually get something in service. Uh, well, hopefully you get something in service anyway, but uh, you get your palm branch, it's different. It's one of those most well-known and well-remembered days of our Christian calendar. And we call the God, we give the palm branches, we proclaim loudly that Jesus is the King of kings and that he is come. Jesus, God in human flesh, begins the final week of his quote-unquote normal personal life, being rightfully called King. It stands out to us. Not only because of the palm branches, not only because of the times of entry, but also because this is one of the few times where Jesus gets the glory to earth, at least in some small measure. It's actually called king. It's actually, in, at least in some ways, treated as a sister. He almost looks the part of a conquering king. He rides into the capital city of his domain, mounted on his feet, his shouts and praises. The people take the palm branches, they cut down, they lay them at his feet, they take off their coats and their coats and lay them at his feet, just as they would do for a returning warrior or a king taking his throne. Yet in this time of fanfare and the whistling and the singing and the shouting and the praises, there is the dark reality that Jesus has not come to take an earthly throne, but a spiritual one. We know that in only a few days, Jesus will be unjustly arrested, falsely accused, tortured, and mercilessly killed for our sins. And it's all part of his grand and wonderful plan to save us, for on the third day, he will triumphantly arrive. Make no mistake, he is not just a king, he is the king. And I will we begin holy. Up to this point, we've spent all of our time looking at Jesus' mercy in the Gospel of Mark. If you've been here with us, that has been our study all throughout Mark. Mercy, as you may remember, is not receiving that which someone has earned. And Jesus' ministry is always filled with all of these characteristics, these godly characteristics. They are always on display. Forgiveness, and grace, and peace, and righteousness, and justice and mercy are always on display. And this mercy has been shown countless times thus far in his miracle. He healed the lame and the blind. He cured the leper. He cast all demons. He has freed many individuals on the conditions that they have, that they have and he's done it mercy for 
all the teachings of God's mercy embedded within them, all of the parables and the inner teachings he shows us with his closest friends, the disciples, they all have mercy at their core. They teach one how to act and conduct themselves, and they reveal what God is doing and what he really cares about, and they set the stage for Jesus to fully reveal himself as Savior and Messiah. Jesus' mercy is always central to his ministry. And nothing will show us more than what will take place in the next week. And we will go to the cross in our stead. And finally, his life will be taken. And rather, he will yield it up for his people. Even the plan for the tree, where Jesus is filled as king, shows his humility and its merciful purposes if we look just a little bit to these purposes. Our scriptures for today open actually before the temple entry. They open with him going to a city near Bethel, Israel. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And on his way there, he goes through the city of Jericho. And while he's leaving the city with his disciples, the blind man is called out to him. A blind man named Barnabas is going to be unknowingly Jesus' last miraculously healed person in the Gospel of Mark. On the other gospel, he will do some healing in the city of Jerusalem, but the gospel of Mark. Barnabas is the last one. And this man, one of very few whose name is recollected when he is healed, falls out to Jesus as he passes by. And Jesus hears the man's cry for mercy. So he gives him that mercy on me. And when Jesus hears the man's cry for mercy, he calls Barnabas forward. And ask Barnabas a simple question. What do you want me to do for you? It might seem foolish to ask such a thing, but Jesus never does anything foolish. It's an opportunity for the blindness to articulate what he really wants, what he really believes, and what he hopes that the Son of David, the Messiah, must do for him. He could have asked Jesus for money. But that was how the crippled made their wages in these days. You couldn't work if you were blind or crippled or lame. And so, we take the money. He could have asked Jesus for more than that. He could have asked him for luxury to be blessed in a better position. Something that blind men could only have dreamed of in this day. But blind man wisely knows that he is speaking not with an earthly ruler or a king of kings. Speaking with Jesus. He knows a little about who Jesus is, and he affirms the faith that he holds in Jesus as Christ. In the Greek, he calls Jesus Rabbi. That is friendly not only as Rabbi or Teacher, but it goes deeper and means something more akin to Master or Lord. He calls him Lord, beloved. And Jesus' response to the blind man bears his up to. As the only one for Christ gives the man his job, your faith, as may do well. The blind man immediately has his self restored and leaps to his feet in joy. And the blind man is his credit. He does something that most all other heroes before him do not do. He follows Jesus to Jerusalem. You can picture this man being one of those holding palm branches and laying his cloak before Jesus. I want to pause a moment before looking at the transcendent entry itself to recognize that Bartimaeus is known as much the Savior. There are many in the gospel who are healed by Jesus who then do not follow him. You might ask, why not? It's the same today, isn't it? The Lord answers a prayer that someone holds in the darkness of time, and then when the matter is resolved, they forget who they were praying to. Bartimaeus, and I would guess most all of you are not that way. When Jesus heals him, not only is his physical blindness in him, but his spiritual as well. And he turns to follow his Messiah. For many of you to connect with you, there may have been a time where the Lord revealed himself and it's being healed. You would have prayers answered and the Lord saved you out of something. He blessed you in some marvelous way. And then it encouraged you to not only call him king and then go on the merry way, but follow him as well. 
Some theologians speculate that the reason why Bartimaeus' name is known while others are not is that because he continued to be an influential figure in the church. He continued to follow Jesus. And most will know that Bartimaeus would be among the crowd following Jesus' king in the next chapter. Whatever happened to the man, we can rest assured that his life was changed when Jesus healed him, not just because he was no longer physically blind, but because he was sick. From Jericho, Jesus will travel now the 15 miles to Jerusalem to conclude his earthly ministry. To not only physically heal folks like Bartimaeus, but far more importantly to spiritually make alive that which is taken. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus visits Jerusalem only once. Now, clearly, Jesus had been there more times. He was required for you to be there several different times throughout the year. If you had been he would have done that. And if you look at other Gospels, he's there for two or at least three times as an adult in the Gospel of John. But there's a reason why Mark mentions his only major travel to Jerusalem. There's a reason why his travel to the city is so singular in this account. And it's because Jesus goes there to do one thing only one time. He goes there to be the sacrifice for salvation of mankind from their sins. And as he enters the city for a final time, Jesus lives both the part of being the king of kings by he is, and also the sacrifice for man's sin that he also is. One great example is what we all remember. He rides into the city, not on a horse, not on a camel, but on the soul of a donkey. The Old Testament book, Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, gives a prophecy regarding the Messiah. There it reads, The just when we are born of God, fancy name for Jerusalem, turn from the daughters of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, and mounted on a donkey, even on the colt, the soul of a donkey. Jesus is the king, but there's humility in his entrance. And looking beneath the clouds and the words of the palm branches, where people were expecting him to do earthly things to establish an earthly kingdom, we can see the Lord's great plans at work. The humility with which he enters is evident by the fact he does not ride that horse or camel, but those are the seats of conquering kings. No God, he is a beast of burden. A beast of labor, and Jesus will labor in Jerusalem for the sins of mankind. He's come not to be admired, but to save. And the people say, for us, the evidence of this fact. For God, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, comes from the Psalm of David, Psalm 118, verse 26. It reads, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, we have blessed you from the hands of the Lord. It's appropriate for Jesus to say, but he's also the sacrifice. And if you were to read the very next verse in that psalm, Psalm 118, verse 27, the verse after the one the people shout, you would see there is a gift of it. For it reads, the Lord is God, and he has given us life. Find the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Jesus is the sacrifice as much as he is the king. And it's all a part of his glorious plan to save any and all who would be called from their sin. He's not bound to the altar, but he is bound to the cross. And that's pretty much where Mark's account ends on the time of Wednesday. Jesus enters Jerusalem, he looks around a bit, and then he goes to a nearby town called Bethany to stay there. If you read the other Gospels, the other accounts, Luke's Gospel gives a little more insight, a few more notable things worth mentioning. Luke 19, 37 through 40 reads, As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, these became silent and stolen for a while. Those verses show us that Jesus 
is as perceived at the very temple gate as he should be, but rather he perceives as he descends the Mount Olives. And interestingly, he descends down the Mount Olives here to join himself, trying to praise them. And on Good Friday, he will be with us in that same Mount, the same Mount of Olives, in exchange to be the sacrifice. He killed for you and me. And the Pharisees were all plotting to kill Jesus, trying rather weakly to rebuke him, but it's not yet Jesus' this time. And so now in this gospel, tells us that Jesus weeps over the city that is going to kill us. Well, that even though Jesus enters himself in praise, he's come to his uncle far more than just glorifying himself. He's come to save sinners by his own body and blood. And not just any sin. Because remember that it's still Jesus. Most of you perhaps remember and know about the rest of the week of the Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem, in the temple itself, and in the surrounding area. On Thursday, he was prepared to eat the Passover meal with his disciples, instituting the sacrament of communion on that same night. On Friday, early in the morning, he will be betrayed by Judas Iscariot, one of his twelve closest friends, one of his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'll be taken before the Pharisees, the Jewish High Council, where he will be illegal and tried, found innocent, and yet proclaimed guilty. He may be only beaten and bloody. He will be taken before Pontius Pilate, and the same thing will happen. And there he will be condemned to die. Jesus will be crucified on a high hill overlooking Jerusalem, and he will die and be laid for rest in the tomb, from which he will arise triumphantly after three days. Palm Sunday is the beginning of the end of gospel chapter 2. And while it is often overshadowed by what comes next, there are two final things to glean from this particular day. The first is that Jesus is the king. We talk about it all the time. You may even call him the king of kings in the word of Lord. You may say to ourselves, but it is worth coming from the word of God they did back then, that Jesus is the king of kings. Rightfully did those folks lay down palm branches in their coats. You and I too should, but we don't serve anyone less than the very Lord in the flesh. It's worth worshiping. The second thing for us to remember is that everything that is happening happens according to Jesus' plan. If you are according to his own plan, and being God in the flesh, he knows full well everything that is going on. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows what the Pharisees are plotting. He knows he's going to be crucified on Friday. He knows that his other disciples will abandon them. He knows all of this, for he is God, and nothing in the life of Jesus happens by accident. Nothing surprises him in his godly nature. And even as he's being born of his king entering Jerusalem, he knows that a few days later they're going to call for his death. Yet that is what he has come to do. Save the world from the sin. The final thing I would leave you with is a combination of the first two that we write to you. It's easy for us to forget that Jesus is not just the King of Kings, but he is also our King. He isn't some foreign entity or power, he is your Lord. And so, beloved, worship him as such. He is deserving of that and far more. It's also good to remember that he is in control, not only of the situations in Scripture, not only of what happens in Holy Week, but also what goes on in your individual life. He always has his finger on your palm. He always watches over you. And the same Lord has planned everything out in advance regarding his life, death, and resurrection. watches over you. And in humility and love, Jesus not only entered Jerusalem as a conquering king, but also as the Savior for all of mankind and for you and me. Praise the Lord, for God in the highest, for greatest is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again come before you on Palm Sunday, and we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful mercy and grace and might and for your master plan to save us from our sins. Watch over us, Father, 
Watch over us in these days. Help us to remember and acknowledge that you are not just the King of Kings. You are also our King. We worship you. We praise you. Lord, we thank you for the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom and the power and the glory of the Lord. I'd like to invite up our ushers to be prepared to take our offering this morning. I remind you for you, if this is your first time here, your first time here in a while, please be in the middle of the day to be here. Your presence is quite good for us. Standing for our closing hymn, Hosanna, Lord Hosanna, found in page 378 or Thank you. 
Thank you. 